Mike, I hope you're having an awesome afternoon. Welcome into the game here in T-Town. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Mike, I want to dive into a lot of different things, but we were just talking about this going into the break. Uh, You've now covered the New England Patriots and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, What's the biggest similarity that you see between Bill Belichick and Nick Saban? Well, I'd say it's the winning. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely start there. I mean, there's obviously a lot of success that both of those guys have had. and Obviously, the the shared history that they have. We all saw the the HBO documentary last year. We know know how much that they – kind of draw upon each other you know, or have drawn upon each other over their careers. But it's weird. A lot of people will compare Saban and Belichick with the media and they're kind of say to me, oh, man, you know, it must be tough to cover those two guys. And to be honest, like, I actually, I'm not sure they're quite the same guy with the media. I think there's there's a lot of differences. And, you know, you, for instance, you ask Nick about an injury, you know, DJ Dale or whoever it is, and he'll say, yeah, you know, the guy sprained his knee, grade two, you know, he's out three weeks, et cetera. You ask Bill Belichick that question and you're just going to get a, a stare down and, you know, the injury report comes out later this week. So, I mean, they're, they're totally different in press conference settings. I know that they both have some of the sound bites and, um, you know, things they'll get on sports center, but I'd say it, it's a lot easier to cover Saban and you can ask questions and get more information out of Saban than you can with Belichick. Belichick, you sort of just have to write off his facial expressions and, and reactions. Wow. That would be a very, very difficult job. But I will tell you, Nick Saban dresses much better than Bill Belichick, right? Yeah, well, I think Belichick's really made an effort, you know, the last couple of years. I know he's uh, he has a long-term uh, girlfriend at this point, I think, has played a role. But, you know, he's he's been really stepping up the uh, the stoop game and, and some of the, the shirt game over the last few years compared to, you know, five, ten years ago when it was more, uh, you know, the cutoff hoodies and, and uh, inside-out sweatshirts and that sort of thing. Mike, I want to get a couple of different things. Uh, let's start with an article that has really grabbed a lot of attention. And, you know, you, you look at throughout this season, we watched Alabama, but something just didn't feel right. Uh, I've covered Nick Saban, uh, not from a beat reporter standpoint, but just from a talk radio standpoint uh, since he's been in Tuscaloosa. And it was something about this year, and we've interviewed a lot of former players and, you know, got different analysis from different people uh, but you kind of point the uh, the meat and potatoes here. You were able to grab Terrell Lewis at the NFL Combine. Kind of talk about maybe your angle with this and how you maybe discovered some of this. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the first time I've gone to the Combine from, you know, college reporter perspective. I, I've been before as an NFL reporter, and, and a lot of the questions you ask those guys in that setting is, you know, have you met with this team and you know, where do you see yourself in the NFL? It's a lot more forward-looking questions, but – in my job now, I have the opportunity to be a lot more retrospective with these guys and, and really debrief them on what happened, you know, good or bad when they were in school. And now that they're away from, you know, that environment and, and quite frankly, un- away from being underneath the Saban umbrella, you get more honesty sometimes. And that's just natural for these players as they, you know, begin to move away from Alabama. Um, and Terrell Lewis really, you know, all last season was, you know, among the better talkers the better interviewers on that team and um you know look i asked all the the defensive players the same question it was you know what went wrong in those auburn and lsu games and i think to varying degrees you know they gave answers and terrell lewis just because of who he is and you know i think he tends to be more honest um you know he he gave i think an answer that certainly you know blown up a little bit uh as far as calling into question you know play calling and communication from the top down was which is what you know the way he described it so um you know i i think there's different ways to look at it depending on which perspective you're coming from uh obviously if you're you know pretty close to the team it's probably not something you want him to, to say or to hear um you know you might want to might want shaheen carter's in, uh, answer for instance where he's saying I, you know, i'm a leader i'm not going to blame anybody else i'm just going to blame myself and maybe that's the answer that um, you know, comes off better, and, and some people might say Terrell Lewis's answer to come off as well that you know he was part of the problem, and you know he, he shouldn't be throwing anybody under the bus. But you know, from our perspective, uh, being from the media, it, it's nice to have somebody who is willing to um, say that if, if they do in fact believe that. And um, you know, that's what he said, and you know, I, I, I'll, I'll take his, his word for it, I guess. Well, you, you look at Terrell Lewis and. You like his opinion or or dislike his opinion. I remember um, it was after the Arkansas game, 
here inside Bryant Denny Stadium, and someone asked him about his sack total. He said, you you doubled your sack total in one game. And he was pretty honest. He said, uh, I hit a switch. And and I think the follow-up was that, is it that simple? And he said, yes, it is. It, it, and so, right, you like his answer, you dislike his answer. He's always been a guy that even, you know, when it's self-critiquing himself, that he's pretty open uh, with his answers. So just based on your opinion, you, you've covered this team. You have uh, have a chance to to work with uh, some great colleagues there, uh, can kind of understand, you know, Pete Golding and Nick Saban's defense. I don't know what the problem was, but I do know there was problems, and maybe this is the first uh, – kind of clue that we've been given on the record that uh, there was some communication issues there there's something just didn't feel right about this team and I know we blame injuries and we talk about injuries and they were part of it but I don't think that's the ultimate uh, you know hey you get healthy and everything's been it, it's fixed yeah you know I believe in the eye test especially in our job too where you know you can't 100% of the time trust everything that you're being told and clearly there was something wrong just from the eye test with that defense and even Raquan Davis, I mean, I asked him about, you know, the LSU and the Auburn games, and I wasn't even asking about communication. I don't even think I, I used that word, and he ended up responding, you know, with that word the same way Terrell did and ended up mentioning guys looking towards the sideline and LSU's offense going fast, and that sort of not caught him off guard, but just it caught the defense in a position where they weren't quite ready with the call. And, um, you know, look, that I'm sure that played a role, and then I asked him, about the, the linebackers and having Christian Harris and Shane Lee in there. And he actually downplayed that and, and said that, you know, that was only part of it and that really everybody was at fault. And, and to Raekwon Scarta, he also was pretty honest about his own season and saying that there was a lot of things that he wasn't doing himself in terms of focus and in detail, which, you know, you could argue has been a problem for him for a couple of years. It's probably going to hurt him at, you know, the NFL level in terms of where he's drafted. But, yeah, it's um, – look, I remember a couple of years ago when I was covering the Bills under Rex Ryan, and we all know some of the discipline issues with Rex Ryan's teams. They had issues with play calling on defense. He had his brother in there, I think was calling the red zone plays, and he had another coach, Dennis Thurman, who was in there. I remember later in the year going to their inside linebacker who was the one getting the play calls, and he, he was pretty honest to me at that time, and he said, look, look the, the calls are coming in late. Like, there's not much I can do out there, and I'm not even getting the call before the play is getting off. And that's sometimes just the frustration that, that players have. And it's a, it's a good point that we can't always blame everything that goes wrong in a game on the players. And I don't think it's fair to blame it all on the coaches either, but this seems like an example where both sides are at fault. And I think that's what Terrell is trying to get at. When you look at Alabama's defense, in your opinion, with all the talent returning, but as you're sitting there covering that NFL combine, uh, there's a lot of defensive talent that came through that building there in Indy. Uh, to get ready for the uh, Sunday afternoon workouts. Um, you, you could make the argument that this defense will be back and better and healthier, uh, but you could also see where they're losing a lot of talent, and that was pretty evident this weekend up there in Indy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's for as much talk as there is about losing Tua and, and Judy and Ruggs, I mean, the offense as a whole might actually be more intact next year, especially when you look at the version of the offense under Matt Jones at the end of last year that might be closer to the 2020 offense than the 2020 defenses, the last year's defense, just because, like you mentioned, Raekwon, Anthony Jennings, Terrell Lewis, um, obviously you're you're adding Dylan Moses, you're adding Josh McMillan back into that mix, you're adding LeBron Ray back into that mix, which is good for them. Um, But then your secondary, I think, is really where the biggest change will be, and that might be the biggest potential problem area going into the season where you lose Xavier McKinney, you lose Trayvon Diggs, you lose Jared Maiden, you, you lose Shaheen Carter. And, you know, I don't know if there's exactly obvious answers on the roster right now as it stands. Uh, obviously, Patrick Sertan is going to be potentially your, your top defensive back that you have out there. And, uh, you know, Jordan Battle and, and some of the other guys that have coming in or coming up through the system. So that's really the area where I, you know, I want to watch now in, in spring practices and see who's playing. Um, the JUCO transfer they have, Ronald Williams, potentially could could play a big role at corner, and you know safety could be a pretty big battle as well. Mike Rodak, uh, AL.com, AL.com, covering the University of Alabama. You also were able to talk to a couple of Auburn players there. I guess they've taken over as the state's uh, biggest school. Is that right? Yeah, again, yeah, it's all part of that. You know, the the debriefing process, as I like to call it, after you know they leave school and. Um, they're able to look at things in a different perspective. And I talked to a few of them and just asked them, you know, what it means to have won the Iron Bowl 
two of the last three years, which is the first time that's happened uh, since before the Saban era in, at, at Alabama. And I also asked them, you know, what it means for these two programs going forward and, and how they kind of see each other stacking up. And um, it was – Noah, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. No, I, I was going to that, – that, that's why I kind of <laughs> ask a generic question because I wasn't even going to take right. a stab at this thing. Yeah, it, it's a tough one. It's much easier to, to type. And I got to say, like, it took me a few times to type it last week to get the spelling down. Um, but he was very honest. And not only about, like you said, Aub- in his eyes, Auburn taking over as the top team in the state, but also about Jalen Waddell. He gave a glowing review of Jalen Waddell, said he's going to win a bunch of awards next year. So kind of – you know, before we all pile on, you know, Noah, I, I think it, it it goes both ways. I think he's just a good talker, and I think he's honest, you know, and just says what he what he feels. So, um, look, I, I think there's the argument of is Al- is is Auburn better head to head than Alabama, and I think the results the last couple of years, obviously trending towards Auburn being head to head better. But then there's overall, where is the program and and who has a better chance to win a national title on a year-to-year basis? I think Alabama's still, you know, firmly ahead in in that race. So, you know, it it might be two different discussions, and and maybe I should have dug a little bit deeper uh, with him to see, you know, which discussion he was exactly referring to. But at the end of the day, you know, it's like the Anthony McElmore comments in basketball, and and Nate Oates, you know, showed it to his team walking out before that Auburn game. It's it's good for the rivalry, and that's what Nate said. Like, it's good to have that that back and forth, and I don't know if, you know, people should spend too much energy trying to pile on. You know Nick Saban, if there's one thing that burns him, it's probably not that defense. Well, I'm mean, sure it is that defense, but it's not uh, the daily day things. I, I bet he looks at that Auburn saying, did I really lose two out of the last three to Gus and the Auburn Tigers? Because, you know, they had their best offensive performance against Alabama. I know it was uh, – you know, it made a freshman quarterback uh, look like a veteran quarterback at times. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, I can imagine that being a point of pride, especially when you look at the, the impact that that game had on Alabama, where if they had won that game, it's not as if they weren't in a position to do so. I mean, you make a kick at the end of the game, you don't throw a pick six to the, at the goal line. There's a lot of things that could have been different. Um, and they're potentially in the SEC title game. They have a shot. Or, sorry, they wouldn't have gone to the SEC title game. They would have gone to the college football playoff. And, you know, you have a shot to, to make some – something happened there so um you know that that's obviously what i think the end goal is for nick i don't know if it's as much just the iron bowl but giving his team a, a chance to play for a title every year i'm sure that that gets under his skin and hell i mean i was down in, in auburn uh, a couple weeks ago when when gus malzahn took the microphone at halftime you know for the trophy presentation for the iron bowl at, at the basketball game and it was saying that they plan on, on keeping it in town and i'm sure it's that sort of thing that just really gets under nick's skin and um, you know, it, it, it's all part of the rivalry again. So it, it's good to have at the end of the day. Mike, what is your uh, interpretation of Scott Cochran leaving? And now we've got uh, nothing official from the University of Alabama, but this has not been a very good kept secret as two guys are going to be replacing him coming into the University of Alabama. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't been reporting as much on that. I've been focused on basketball and then the combine, but Matt said it's from our my colleague here at AL.com has done a great job on that the last couple of days and Michael Casagrande as well. And just from reading them, you know, it seems like it, it it's a lot about sports science and we see the new building going up uh, right next to Malmore. And uh, it's not only the Indiana strength coach, I understand it, but also uh, another person within their program who's involved with sports science who is coming to Alabama as well. And that's very much what Nick seems to, um, to want uh, is more of a scientific approach and uh, look, I mean, I've seen that at the NFL level as well, where even when I started covering the Patriots or the Bills, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot going on from that perspective. But within the last couple of years, for instance, the Bills have hired three, four or five people who just have a sports science, um, you know, physiological, you know, that, that sort of realm background where it's more medical based, um, you know, scientific based than just a strength coach, you know, yelling at guys to, you know, do more bench press or do more squats or whatever, which, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to pigeonhole Scott Cochran into that, that realm, but, you know, there is, you know, certainly there's, there's aspects of strength and conditioning that are more motivational and then more scientific. And, you know, it seems like Alabama is moving more towards the scientific end and, uh, like I said, a lot of NFL teams are, are building new facilities even that 
support that with sleep pods and all this technology. The Bills just did it, you know, spent $40 million on it. The Patriots did it a few years ago, and obviously now Alabama's doing it as well. Mike, you can connect with Mike Rodak uh, there on the Twitter accounts. R-O-D-A-K is the best way. It's at Mike Rodak. Uh, AL.com is the website. AL.com covering the University of Alabama. He's one of three beat reporters covering the Alabama Crimson Tide for AL.com. Hey, Mike, thank you. Thank you again for visiting with us this afternoon. We greatly appreciate uh, the conversation and I thought your article was very fascinating. It's got a lot of reaction. I'm sure it will uh, this afternoon here in Tuscaloosa. Mike, thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it.